Hi, welcome to my channel. I'm currently going over how to create a simple role-playing game. In this video, I discuss how to implement a layer of obstacles. The purpose of this is to keep the PC, the playing character, from walking into areas I would rather keep him out of. For example, I do not want him to wander off the sides of the playing area. I'm picking up from the end of the last video, which explained how to create and implement a playing character. I have included links to that video in the description. In any case, we now have our player character and a blank background. The main thing that I'm going to do in this video is implement an obstacle layer that will prevent the PC from wandering either off the screen or going into or through another space that we would rather they didn't, such as a wall and so on. What I'm going to do in this video is look at the Rich Tiles module I've just added. Here we will look at how I've set up a class designed to be a parent class. Then we'll see how easy it is to subclass it. The Rich Tiles class will be a very important class for us because we will use it to differentiate obstacle tiles from, for example, persistent tiles. But that's a subject for the next video. I won't mention it again in this one. Now, let's dive in and step through how to create the code that will read in the data that will be used to create an obstacle layer. Sounds complicated, but it's not. First, we create a new module, rich tiles, and that's richtiles.py. You should be able to see it there. So that we can debug this more easily, I create a driver class. The purpose of this is so that I can display the obstacle layer on its own. This will hopefully make the code easier to debug because it will make it easier to isolate where in the code the mistake was made. As usual, let's begin at the if name equals main statement. As before, we give zone name the value docs and map name the value map 00. Then we fire up the environment driver class. That is, we initialize it and instantiate it in my driver. We then use the object variable my driver to access the class methods read data and main. And that's the overview. Now let's look at the initialization function of the environment driver. First, we check to see that the zone name and map names are valid. Initialize the graphics engine, declare the environment variable and initialize it to none, none type in other words, and set keep looping to true. Now we go back to the if name equals main statement and having initialized the environment driver class, let's now look at how to read in the data that interests us. As you can see, this is a very simple function, one that consists of only two lines. As you can see, the obstacles class is just a stub. It is a subclass of rich tiles. So let's look at the initialization function of rich tiles. As with our other classes, first we read in and validate the zone and map names. Then we assign a sprite group to the inner variable. Next, we assign a variable I call map kind, the name of the class that is subclassing this class. And hopefully what I've done there on the screen will make sense of that. Basically, the idea is that if multiple child classes are subclassing a parent class, that when you call one of these classes, you want to know which class has been called. In this case, it would be obstacles. Since there are cases in which I may want tile size to differ from image size, I declare these separately. Tile size is most relevant to moving a tile, while image size is most relevant to, as the name suggests, the size of the image. Finally, there is a new variable, images used. I use this variable to keep unique copies of the images that I'm using to display the obstacles. So for instance, if a sack of grain is an obstacle, that will be an image that is used. I do this to save time. If I didn't use this variable, which is a dictionary, I would have to read the images from the file system and load them for each individual tile. So it is much quicker this way to scoop up the images, load them into a dictionary, and then just draw from the dictionary. And that is especially the case if the map contains a lot of tiles. Okay, so now let's talk about reading in the data. Now that we have initialized the class rich tiles, let's use the read data function to read in the data. What that function looks like is up there on the screen. As you can see, it contains two function calls, and these calls are to the methods read in images and read tiles. Let's look at read in images. I've put the function up on the screen. The purpose of this function is to load only those images that we are going to need to create the obstacle layer. So first, we set images used to an empty dictionary. Then I get each and every unique map value from the map, and for instance, map 00, zero obstacles.txt. I get each and every unique map value from the text file, and that's the text value. Uh, I've put that up there on the screen. For example, this text file would yield one unique tile name, b00, while this other file would yield b00 and m10. And so in the first case, it would just be one, and in the second case, it would be two. And if you see those files, I hope that's clear. I'm not going to step through the get map values function, but hopefully it's fairly straightforward. If it is not, please do leave me a comment and I'll get back to you. 
Okay, so having obtained the unique file values, we now form a file path, the file path to the obstacles.txt file. And of course, that's going to be relativized to this particular map zone. Putting the file path aside for a moment, we will now step through each unique tile name that is contained in obstacles unique values. First of all, we see that this function has a nested function, one that takes a list of dictionaries and a name. There's a for loop that looks through the elements of the list and checks to see if the name that has been passed through matches the name in one of the dictionaries. If it does, then that dictionary is returned. If it doesn't, then none is returned. If a dictionary is returned, it is appended to the list variable obstacle tiles. Now that we have all the records we want, we load the corresponding images into memory. That is what we do with this bit of code, and it's up there on the screen. After the image is loaded, we save it to a dictionary along with the image name and the tile name. This dictionary is then added to the images used directory. And that's it for read and images. Now we go back to the rich tiles class and the read data function and step through read tiles. Once again, the first thing we do is assemble the path to the file we want. In this case, map00 obstacles. I then test to see if the file is empty. Empty files cannot be uploaded to GitHub. If it is empty, then I call the exit function and the file is, it's fine. I then run the following lines of code. They return all the lines in the file, isolate the values and put the whole thing into a list, which I call big list. Okay, so next we form another file path, this time to the file that contains information related to, tied to, each of the tile names. We then read in all the records in the obstacles file and store them in the obstacle dictionary variable. Now that we have the contents of the obstacle file suitably stored in the obstacle dictionary variable, we grab our big list variable, the one filled with information from the obstacle map, and loop through the values. After some error checking, I instantiate the rich tile class and pass in the column number i, the row number j, the tile name, and the image dictionary that we retrieved from images used. Let's take a look at that now. After some error checking, we transfer the name of the tile to self tile name, the name of the image to self image name, and the image itself into a variable called, for obvious reasons, the image itself. I then initialize the variables we will need in the class. I think these are all fairly straightforward. Note that size contains a string that specifies the size we would like the shape to be. The possible values are original, custom, and small. I may add additional values later. Note also that I have given this tile hit points. This is because, as you will see, these tiles can represent, for example, a door that a player may want to break through. In that case, we would want to reduce the door set points to zero and at which point it would disappear or something. Okay, that's it for instantiating a tile in the variable called new object. Now we use new object to read in the data the class will need. We pass through the list of dictionaries we read from the obstacles text file. Here is the code for that. As you can see, we have another nested function helper and it is the same as the other one I walked through earlier, so I won't step through the code. As you can see in the first line here, the first line of the function, I use the nested function helper to grab the appropriate dictionary out of the list. If a dictionary is not passed back, an error is raised. The main thing that the read data method does, the main thing it accomplishes, is adjusting the XY images. After we finished reading in the data, we add the new object to self inner, and that's it. This brings us back to the read data function in rich tiles. This, in turn, brings us back to the read data function in the drivers class. And that completes that function. Finally, we call main. This may not always be the case, but at the moment, none of the obstacles move. I take advantage of this. So before I set the main loop running, I feed the obstacle tiles into the alt sprites group. Those sprites then will never need to be updated, at least in this very simple version of the program. Here is the code for that function. As you can see, it is all very, very simple. All we have to do now is add the sprites that are in the inner variable to the alt sprites group. When we enter the while loop, we set the clock to present 10 frames per second, and we call the handle events function. This function is really just a skeleton, but it is all we need in this context. After all, all we want to do is display the obstacles layer. As you can see, the first line of the for group grabs each event. On the screen now, you can see the code I've written to handle only those events I'm interested in. In this case, I only handle events that have to do with the window closing. If that occurs, that is, if Pygame quit or Pygame escape is detected, then keep looping is set defaults, the while loop exits, and the program quits. 
We next call the draw method. Again, this is very simple. I just fill the screen with the background color, draw all sprites to the screen, and then flip the display and present it to the user. If and when keep looping is set to false, Pygame quit and sys exit are called and the program ends. Up there on the screen now, that's what this program looks like. Now that we have created the obstacle layer, we need to hook it up to the main program. So now, let's take a break and talk a bit about the structure of the program. The game class is an umbrella class that contains all the other classes and which contains the main game loop. It also holds the player and soon to be introduced NPC classes. The environment class though is an umbrella class for all the environment classes. Generally speaking, each class represents a layer. So it is to the environment module we head now and place the obstacles layer therein. As you can see, the walkables layer is already there. I introduced this layer in our first video, so I won't step through its creation again here. I put a link to that in the description below though, if you'd like to take a look. There's an index there, you can go right to the part you're interested in. So, okay. In the initialization function of the environment class, you can see that I have typed self obstacle and in so doing have instantiated the obstacles class, but we have already stepped through this. As the name suggests in read data, we call the read data function. Now, if we want to view the obstacles, we must add it to update classes and call obstacles update class. As you can see, I have commented out self walkable since for now, I only want to show the obstacle layer. Now that that's done, let's look at the game class. We need to incorporate the player class from our first video. I added a line to read data, self player read data. Similarly in handle events, I reproduced the handle events function from the last video where I went over it in some detail. In general, what I've done is I've simply copied over the module from the last video and added an environment variable to it. So let's run the program and see what happens. As you can see, now the player can no longer walk off the playing surface because the tiles within the obstacle layer prevent it. And here's how I arranged that. Recall that the last time we had no obstacles to implement, so all we did was multiply the dx and dy variables by the movement increment. Now, however, we do have an obstacle layer, so the second part of the if statement is where we're going to look. This time, before we increment the x and y variables, we save their values. Then we adjust the x and y values as before. For now, we ask for the rectangle that describes the image that represents the player's body. This is the image that is currently being displayed. We then move the rectangle to its new position. After this is done, we call sprite collide any to see whether the current image that is being displayed, its position, intersects with any of the rectangles that describe the positions of any of the images in the obstacles layer. So basically, we're just asking, does the player sprite collide with any of the sprites in the obstacle layer? If it does not, if there is no overlap, then none is returned, N-O-N-E. But if there is overlap, then the image it overlaps with is returned. Since at the moment I don't care which image is returned, but only that the player has run into something, I only check to see whether none is returned. If it was not, if none was not returned, so if an image was returned, then we know that the player has encountered an obstacle and we assign X and Y to their previous values. We then move the player back to its previous position. This time, however, we make sure that the position it is moved to, the X and Y coordinates, are whole numbers. I do this so that the player character does not get off track. Yes, it results in the player bouncing around a bit after they collide with a wall, but we will fix this down the line. And that's it. Thank you for watching. If you would like to see more content like this, please like and subscribe. Until next time, good coding.